So welcome to the third Vegetable Winter webinar, and we're excited today to hear from Marion Murray. She's the IPM project leader uh, for Utah Pests and USU Extension, and she coordinates the Utah IPM program. Um, if you get the fruit advisories or any of the advisories, you'll know her name very well. She writes the fruit advisories and runs the IPM pest advisories for the whole state. And her interests are diseases of tree fruits and improving the adoption of integrated pest management in tree fruits and the green industry. And she's taught me a lot about integrated pest management, a lot about monitoring and outreach and um, so many things. So we're excited to hear from her and we'll turn the time over to her. I think you might be on mute, Marion. Okay. Yep. Now I Thanks, you. Cammie. You're yeah, welcome. and we we so appreciate Cammie bringing her on board. She's been with us for a year, yeah, and has done a lot. So <laughs> Thank thanks. <you. laughs> All right, so we are going to cover um, biological control in Utah vegetables, and the first thing I wanted to point out is when you think about biological control or even the insects that occur, insect pests, about 80% of the control is due to beneficials um, and, and other factors. And that's a lot. And there was a study done out of Cornell that uh, looked at, well, what does this equate to in terms of a dollar figure? And it's about four and a half billion um, in services from biological control insects. So if you're interested in uh, focusing on pest management via biological control, it's a part of integrated pest management. So of course you wanna know your crops, know your pests, and of course know the natural enemies that might be controlling them. But it's so important to implement preventive measures. So you have to start from the beginning when you're planting your crop all the way even through winter um, in creating habitat for those beneficials, so healthy soil and plants. And in some cases, you can augment some uh, beneficials. Um, but bon monitoring is super important, and you guys learned about that through Cami's um, webinar a few months ago. And there are some cases, though, uh, with biological control where you may need to uh, uh, apply some treatments. And there are biopesticides, so kind of sticking with that whole thing, because the predators kind of are lagging behind the peaks of the prey. So there's that cyclical effect where they're not quite in sync. So there may need to be some intervention. So what I'll uh, talk about are uh, some examples of beneficial insects, uh, how to conserve them, and then some resources that may help you uh, in your own endeavors. So when you think about the types of natural enemies that you see out in nature, uh, there's predatory insects, and of course they eat prey, um, and they can feed sometimes um, as a, both a young and an adult. And then there are parasitoids that require a, their prey in order to complete their life cycle. So they have a specialized uh, life cycle. And then there's pathogens like nematodes, viruses, etc. So I'm not going to focus on those, just to uh, um, talk about some examples of predators and parasitoids. All right, so some predator examples. Now, a lot of times if I ask people, well, give me an example of a beneficial insect or a predator, and sometimes they'll may, they may say, praying mantis is the, the first thing that comes out of their mouths. Um, but in reality, praying mantis is not a uh, huge contributor to pest control in the landscape or in the garden. It moves very slowly. Uh, it sits and waits, often by flowers. So you can see this guy has caught a um, honeybee. And that's not necessarily what we want to uh, control. So they eat slowly, and when they're done eating, it's about a few hours before they take their next meal. So um, praying mantis, they're fun to watch, um, but they will feed on all kinds of insects. And like I said, they usually wait at flowers. Um, 
and, and walk very slowly. But it can be fun to see how they hatch um, from their egg sac. Now they lay their egg sac over the winter and then in spring under the right conditions, uh, several hundred young um, mantids will emerge. And they need a food source right away, so often they're going to just eat each other until they can find uh, some different kind of prey. All right, lady beetles is the other most common um, beneficial that people think about. And there's so many different species of lady beetles, uh, different color variations. Um, and of course, they're all uh, very beneficial. They'll feed on aphids um, in the vegetable garden, spider mites, um, other soft bodied insects, including leafhoppers. And both the adults and their young are predaceous. So wherever prey occurs, that's where they're going to be found. And I want to point out that one species of lady beetle, um, at least for me, is one of the most common that I see, and that's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And you can identify it from the letter M on the, the pronotum there. Um, but it comes in color variations from yellow to bright red, no spots to many spots. But it's a um, non-native, and it's in some places it is actually taking over habitat and uh, space from our native lady beetles. Another species is uh, the Stethorus. And it's a lady beetle that is specialized against spider mites. So it um, is teeny tiny. If you could imagine the size of spider mites, which you hopefully learn from Cami, these uh, Stethorus mites are also very tiny to see, but they're going to occur on the undersides of the leaves. All right, so in general, the lady beetles overwinter as adults, and then they emerge in spring, and they lay these clusters of bright yellow eggs and again they're going to be where the prey is found usually on the undersides of leaves but here on the left you can see uh, the aphids are uh, were so plentiful they're on the upper side of the leaves um, so the adults can live up to three months so they're going to be laying eggs all throughout the season and then uh, like I said there's many species so the larvae uh, will look different depending on the species and uh, they'll uh, right away off in search of prey. They're not as cannibalistic as the, those praying mantids I mentioned. Uh, but when the larvae complete their life cycle, they will um, form a pupa and in a few weeks emerge as an adult lady beetle. So a lot of predators will feed um, by piercing their prey and then they will inject saliva into the prey itself and that kind of um, pre-digests the contents in the prey and then they'll suck out those juices. So it makes it easier for them to consume um, individuals that are the same size as them or even larger than uh, themselves. You can imagine us eating something <laughs> the same size as, as we are. All right, so I'll show you this picture, and you can think to yourself, uh, well, these are eggs. You know, what, what might these eggs be? So they are eggs of a lacewing. So a lacewing is another very important predator of those soft-bodied insects. Uh, the difference with lacewings from lady beetles is that the adults do not feed on um, their prey. The adults just feed on pollen and nectar. So they require uh, these be uh, blooming plants in order to, uh, to survive. Uh, but their larvae, they'll feed on the same things that the, the lady beetles feed on. And we have two species of the top pictures are green lacewings and the bottom picture is brown lacewing. And you don't often see them during the day. They, they are nocturnal, uh, so they'll be visiting the flowers in the evening. Um, but they overwinter as adults, just like the lady beetles, and uh, they lay the, their eggs on these silken stalks. And the brown lacewing will lay single eggs, shown in the left picture, whereas the green lacewing, which is the most common, will lay those clustered eggs, shown on the right. So this is what the larvae look like. Um, they have the uh, 
sickle shaped mandibles and they just they really will munch their way through a colony of aphids um, eating about 400 aphids in uh, the lifetime of a single larva so when predators are searching for prey they're not they don't see they're actually searching by uh, feel by chemical senses and uh, here it's grabbed and held on to its prey with the mandibles and again it's injecting its saliva into the aphid and um, they'll as soon as it's done uh, consuming the contents of the aphid um, it throws the shell aside and moves right on to uh, its next victim <laughs> Okay, so um, when you think about the groupings of predators for the soft-bodied insects, the aphids, uh, leafhoppers, etc., there's three, the lady beetles, the lacewings, and then this third one, the surfid fly, that are the most uh, common and most important. So this uh, brown looking, looks like we might think it's a slug, uh, it's actually a maggot of the surfid fly. And it is has many different there's many many different species of surfid flies so that maggot may be that brown dull color or olive colored or yellow um, but the adult is a fly and it sort of looks like a bee but the uh, the fly just has one pair of wings whereas the bee has two pair um, and this is also known as a hoverfly so I'm sure many of you have seen this they fly kind of flat and um, hover over their flowers looking for uh, the right pollen nectar source. So they overwinter as pupae in the soil and emerge in spring, and they will lay a single egg amongst uh, aphid colonies. And the egg is sort of like a little grain of sand, um, rice. Um, and you may wonder, well, so how are the surfid flies and the lacewings, how are they finding the aphids? You know, they're flying around. They can actually uh, sense two ways. The chemical exudates from plants that are being fed upon by insects. Uh, the uh, predators can cue in on those chemicals, um, but they can also sense the honeydew. And the honeydew kind of stimulates them to, to lay these eggs. So the leaf on the left does not have any, it's covered with aphids, doesn't have any uh, predators on it. And the leaf on the right has a few small surfid fly maggots that um, have just consumed uh, most of the aphids on that leaf um, in a matter of a day or so. So again, very, very important um, predators in the landscape that we may not really think of from day to day. So again, the adults, they don't feed on prey, they only feed on uh, pollen and nectar. So they need that flower source. And uh, the larvae, again, they're gonna be found wherever the, the um, prey occurs. So if you find a colony of aphids or leafhoppers, spider mites, look for these different uh, larval predators. All right, so a different uh, type of predator is the minute pirate bug. It's a true bug has a long um, mouth part called a stylet. So it pierces its prey uh, and sucks out the contents. And its name implies it's very tiny. So you pretty much uh, need a, a hand lens to see it, um, but they do move around fairly quickly. So that could be an indication of its presence. Uh, on the right there, it's feeding on a small thrips. So these uh, overwinter as adults. And the females actually lay eggs inside the plant tissue. So you're never really gonna see the eggs, uh, but the larvae or the nymphs are um, cream colored and uh, same shape as the adults, but lack the wing pads and, and the coloration. One thing to note with this is that the adults, they do feed on the prey, but they also require pollen and nectar uh, for reproduction, okay? And typically, if you're looking for these um, for minute pirate bugs, they're going to occur on the undersides of the leaves. They're, um, don't, they don't like to be exposed and will also um, do a lot of their feeding at night as well. 
Okay, so you probably learned about spider mites from uh, Cami's webinar, and uh, they cause the stippling on the leaves, and they're found on the undersides of the leaves. And as they feed, they're, they're pretty much staying in one spot. Um, but, so we have a predatory mite, and the common one is the western predatory mite that's very important in uh, controlling our uh, pest spider mite. It also feeds on some other mite species as well as pollen. Um, but the, as the spider mites are feeding in one place, the predatory mites are moving around the colony very quickly, looking for their next prey source. And they're pretty easy to identify from the pest mites. The predatory mite on the right image is shown at the top. It's more of a pear shape and it's a cream color. Uh, whereas our pest mite is oval shaped and has those two black spots on either side of its body. And, and those black, black spots are actually um, exudates from its feeding on the leaves. So here are some uh, predatory mites cleaning themselves and then off and attacking the, uh, the prey spider mites. So again, they'll feed the same way, injecting a... Uh, a toxin that pre-digests the contents and uh, takes a while to consume, but again, very important um, predator of our spider mites. So there's no way to cover everything, all the beneficials um, in this webinar, but some others that are important to note are spiders. Many people don't like spiders, but they really do a lot uh, in terms of our taking care of uh, pest insects. Ground beetles doing a lot of work as well. You don't see them. They're under mulch, hidden in plant areas. Um, we have a predatory stink bug and also assassin bug. And, and there's others as well. So uh, now I'm going to switch gears to the other group of uh, beneficial insects, parasitoids. Uh, but in the meantime, have there been any questions that have come through? No, there are not any questions yet. But feel free oh, to ask. Uh, Kami, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Hmm. Can you can you hear me? You don't appear to be on mute, but for some reason I'm not hearing you. Okay, one second. <laughs> Let's um Okay, can you hear just me now? A sec. Um let me Amy, I think it's gonna be on her and I got a feeling she, she can't hear either one of us. Okay. Hmm. That's right. Um, let me, should I just uh, tell her in chat? Yeah, that's, sure. actually, that's what I was going to, that's what I'm doing now. Well, okay. I think I'm just going to carry on. I'm not sure why. How about now? Can you hear Can me? You? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there is one question. Okay. Um, can you speak of specific insects for each fruit tree? <laughs> <laughs> Every single um, fruit tree that, that grows in Utah. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> well, that is a good question. And uh, what we, we should probably plan to do some of these webinars for fruit. These webinars right now are focused on vegetable pests. And this one right here is focused on the beneficials. So to talk about the fruit pests would be um, a completely another topic of conversation. So maybe the person that asked it could shoot me an email if there's a specific question. I would certainly be happy to address that. Okay. And a lot yeah, of the, yeah, I was going to say a lot of these beneficials I'm talking about, they apply across the board to a variety of different crops, and including uh, our fruit crops as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank um, you. And then I'll put your email in the chat. And someone asked, why is the minute pirate bug called a pirate? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Hmm. I actually don't know. Minute pirate bug. Well, it's stealthy. <laughs> it has kind of a black and white coloration. <laughs> Who knows why some of these, uh, where some of these insects get their names. I think it has to do with its uh, stealthy, um, vicious attacks on its uh, prey. All right, okay. so we'll move Should along. Okay. Oh, wait, actually, oh. sorry. There's one more. 
Um, to avoid impacting beneficials, does that require abstaining from all pesticides or do you have an example of a pesticide that can be used that will effectively control a pest without harming beneficials? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I, I will touch on that a little later, but there's lots of um, biological pesticides that would be used if you're using biological control and they specifically will target certain pests. And uh, so the beneficials a lot of times won't be affected. So they're considered selective uh, pesticides. And then also it's the timing of when um, certain pesticides might be applied that um, won't affect the beneficials. Like horticultural oil, if you're going back to the fruit tree example, applied during the dormant season, we really take care of a lot of the pest eggs, but have no effect on beneficials because they're not active at that time of year. Um, but certainly, yeah, there's, there's others. Um, spinosad is another example. It um, contains a metabolite of a naturally occurring soil bacterium. And again, it's specific to certain pests, but a lot of beneficials may not be affected by it. Uh, so that's another one where if there's a more um, specific question, you can email me, but I will touch a little bit on that in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. All, all right. Thanks. Okay. So um, now I'll move along to parasitoids, okay? So by parasitoids, what I mean is um, they're groups of insects. They can be wasps, flies, um, and some others that need to complete their life cycle inside or on top of uh, their prey. So here, for example, um, is a life cycle of parasitoid wasp targeting aphids. So it needs to lay its egg inside the aphid, and then the larva of the wasp grows in the aphid, and the aphid is actually still alive during this period. It's still feeding until the point at which that larva needs to um, pupate or change into the adult wasp, and then it will emerge. So uh, just like some of those other um, predators I mentioned, the parasitoids need pollen and nectar to survive. It's only their young that feed on the prey. So here is a uh, parasitoid female wasp laying a single egg inside uh, her aphid prey and somehow she knows if an aphid already has a larva in it, already has an egg in it. She's going to skip that aphid and move on to the next one. Um, but she'll lay up to 200 eggs. So you can imagine uh, the single female taking care of a large colony of aphids. So then the uh, larva develops inside the aphid and then will uh, chew its way out and emerge as a, an adult wasp. So the... May? Yes. I have a question that I missed. It was... How do you know for sure if the eggs you are seeing are good or future bad villains? Okay, so general eggs on, say, a leaf, for, for example. Um, it's, you don't know until you have learned about the biology of those insects. So um, a lot of them, you know, it's taken us a few years to really kind of get uh, an understanding or feel for what's good, what's not. So you really have to get out into your garden or farm with your hand lens and look. And uh, you'll find it's a little time consuming, but it's also a lot of fun. So find some eggs. You could even um, just watch them day to day, see what they hatch into. Um, but a lot of the eggs that I've shown you, the bright yellow ones are lady beetles. Uh, the grains of rice are the surfed flies. You will, they're pretty easy and you will get to know uh, or become familiar with them. All right. Okay, so um, back to the parasitoid wasps. If a aphid has been parasitized, we call it a mummy because eventually it's going to swell up, stop moving, um, and just you know kind of look really fat and obvious among the aphid colony. So there on the top left, you can see those dark uh, tan fat aphids. Those have all been parasitized, so those are all aphid mummies. Uh, and the coloration could be tan, it could be black, brown. Um, the hole that you can see in some of these means that the adult wasp has already emerged. So if you're scouting for uh, pests, you want to look for these aphid mummies. 
And that's going to help you make a decision on, well, are the parasitoid wasps actually taking care of this problem? Or do I need to intervene, um, maybe with some insecticidal soap or horticultural oil? All right, so the parasitoid wasps, they can be focused on aphids, but they can also, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of different species. So some will only lay their eggs um, in beetle larvae, um, even in other wasp larvae or caterpillars. So the, the size can be minute for these wasps up to fairly large. But again, they all feed on nectar. Um, sometimes the um, larvae of the wasps will feed on the outside of their prey, and those are called ectoparasitoids. This, what is shown here is the, uh, if you grow raspberries, you might be familiar with the raspberry horntail, which tunnels into the top parts of uh, the raspberry canes. And this uh, ectoparasitoid wasp is a real common um, wasp that can help control the, the raspberry horntail. But, they can also feed on the inside. So this caterpillar that you just saw has um, uh, maybe 100 or so larval um, parasitoids inside its body. And this is what we're looking at is inside the larva here. And these guys are feeding on the contents of the caterpillar. Um, the caterpillar is still alive. It's still eating uh, so that there's still food to feed these larvae. But eventually, the larvae will finish their life cycle inside the caterpillar, and they will need to emerge to pupate into adult wasps. So they'll emerge through tiny holes through the caterpillar. And this, you may see this on the um, tomato hornworm. So that caterpillar obviously is dead. <laughs> Uh, so the wasps, they can also um, parasitize eggs of, of other insects too. So that just gives you an idea of this diversity of these parasitoids um, that we don't, again, we don't really think about this happening, um, but it's going on and, uh, you know, taking care of 80% of our uh, pest insects. And Marianne, we have another question. All right, so that was just a quick ex few examples of some of our beneficials but um, you really want to if you want to take advantage of their services it's important to uh, conserve the beneficials so um, Cami have there been any question any more questions that have come through yes can you hear me yes okay um, what are your thoughts on use of neem oil on vegetables would it be okay to eat yeah neem oil is um, uh, touted to take care of all kinds of different pests, including powdery mildew. I wouldn't say it's the um, the most effective, but it certainly can be used, and um, the fruit can be eaten within about four hours. So it's it's very safe to use if that's what you would decide to to use. The issue with the neem oil is that it needs to come into contact with whatever pests you're trying to manage. You can't just kind of lightly spray the surface of the leaves and think that it's going to do its job. So you just have to make sure you get nice, good coverage um, on the entire plant. All right, so anything else? No, nope, that's okay. it. All thanks. right, thanks. Okay, so when you want to conserve um, your beneficials, the terminology is conservation biological control. And it's kind of a a mindset of how you're going to manage your whole uh, farm, vegetable, plot, etc. in ways that are going to promote and encourage this beneficial or biological control. So what I mean by that is providing um, plants that give nectar and pollen, and that can be through insectary strips or plantings along the borders of your farm. And a lot of insects, they need shelter, and they need places to overwinter as well. So that can be done through um, grass banks, hedgerows, um, not tilling, kind of leaving that debris, uh, using some certain organic mulches and cover crops. All of that will provide that shelter 
uh, overwintering sites. And then we had that question about, well, you know, certainly pesticides, a lot of them can kill the beneficial. So protecting the, uh, not only the habitat that you're planting, but also the crop um, by reducing your pesticide use. So there's been a lot of research showing the benefits of um, these, this conservation biological control. So this uh, was out of Mich Michigan State University, where they showed that increasing the amount of vegetation and also the structure in terms of uh, shelter resulted in the highest um, effects of predation on this particular pest. They were looking at imported cabbage worms. And even in uh, California, they've done a lot of research on planting hedgerows along the uh, borders of farms. So in this example, they just looked at, they wanted to see what was the uh, difference in the number of beneficials and the number of pests found in these hedgerows. And the presence of the beneficials far outweighed the pests. And they also found that these beneficials moved um, up to about 100 feet into the garden space. So the conclusion, of course, was that these hedgerows were providing a great benefit in biological control. Mary? And in mid yes. Uh, what is a grass bank? Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna get to that in one second, but it's essentially a long strip, narrow strip, up to 200, 300 feet of certain grass species, and the idea is that it's protective area for ground beetles. They'll stay in that grass bank, and at night. Um, move out into the farm or garden to prey on a lot of the soil dwelling pests. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'll show a picture of that in a sec. Uh, so Michigan, um, they wanted to see, well really how, what's the percentage of these various um, beneficials that are actually visiting flowers? And found um, a huge diversity in the beneficials. And uh, the minute pirate bug was one of the most common the um, chalcins, the parasitoid wasps, lady beetles, etc. So constant visitation of flowers by uh, by beneficials. And I don't expect you to you know quickly get all this information from this slide. Um, but what the, the th these are some of the flowers that they were looking at in Michigan. Uh, the top three would be ones that bloom in the spring, and that number there is the average number of beneficials that uh, visited those flowers per day uh, when it was in peak bloom. So um, let's see, the bottom bar is summertime. So Monarda or bee balm, very popular for the beneficials, uh, Lobelia, goldenrod. So um, it's um, this the idea of this uh, slide here is just to show the importance of having a rotational uh, bloom period throughout the season rather than focusing on one particular time period. But in general, the types of flowers that are most visited by beneficials are ones that have uh, exposed nectar, um, small flowers, kind of a flat top, um, because these beneficials are small. They're not going to be visiting the large, um, I don't know, daylily or rose type flowers. They want these very small um, flowers. On the bottom left is alyssum, uh, dill, cilantro, coriander, buckwheat. All of those are, are excellent choices. So here are examples of the insectary strip. And it's, so it's just how it sounds. It's a strip, narrow strip through the garden, alternating uh, rows. Um, and it can be up to 50 feet or so from the next insectary strip. And again, a mix of uh, flowers or like alyssum, one that blooms for a very long period of time would be the optimal choices. And again, the downside with this whole thing is that you're taking up space from your farm and you are also needing to maintain these uh, uh, beneficial plantings. So those, you kind of have to weigh the um, benefits and the costs of those two uh, ideas. All right, obviously border plantings are gonna be around the outer edge and they can be a mix of um, shrubs, trees, and uh, perennials. So all of those have been shown to be effective.
Now on the top left, there's that uh, example of a grass strip. Now the name that people refer it to is called a beetle bank. And it got that name because in England, um, where these natural banks of grass occurred, they found that they were having a lot better um, control or better or fewer pest insects in areas near where these grass banks were. So they thought, well, can this be incorporated into an actual farm? And um, there's been a, a lot of work done on proving that it is effective. And that the grass is typically planted on a slightly raised um, bank. And again, like I said, the top two pictures are examples. It can be up to 200 feet long. Uh, the lower left is an example of some coarse mulch which is also um, provide shelter for some of the, the beneficials. And then on the right lower picture is a uh, cover crop grown in between the rows of the plant. So it's an example of a, a no-till uh, cover crop rotational type planting. Again, keeping it diverse and providing that, uh, that habitat. Okay, so uh, any other questions about this this idea of the, the conservation biological control? No questions for now. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. thanks. Uh, so yeah, so uh, Oh, actually, a yeah. couple just came okay. in. Um, doesn't mulch also provide protection for pests? Yes, and I was gonna mention that, but uh, hey. <laughs> so ligus bugs um, will, uh, find cover in, in mulch and ligus bugs feed on uh, flowers and um, get inside of, say, broccoli, et cetera. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I'm just not thinking of another pest insect off the top of my head. But again, it's this uh, kind of balancing um, the costs and benefits, but also using multiple practices. So if you're just going to use, you know, heavy, coarse mulch and nothing else, then you might uh, find that it's not really that successful. But if you're using some other practices, mixing in um, these different habitats, then over time you'll start to definitely see the benefits. Thank you. Well, okay, was there another one or no? Yes, you mentioned neem oil and spinosad. How effective is Tanglefoot sticky tape stuff? So Tanglefoot is, what it is, it's just a, a sticky um, paste, clear paste that um, people might use, say, around a tree. You might wrap, say, duct tape around a tree and then apply this tangle foot. And what, the idea is that it's going to prevent insects from crawling up or down and it's going to get stuck in that tangle foot. Um, so some people recommend it for codling moth, which is a pest of apples. And I would in a vegetable garden, um, again, it's not going to be something that will you would want to mess with because it can be um, messy and it will just become filled with dirt. So uh, Tanglefoot is more for maybe monitoring or um, just kind of seeing what activity is going on, but not, not necessarily for a, a pest control option. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So I only want to just comment a few minutes on um, biopesticides in terms of this whole biological control idea. So there are dozens and dozens of different biopesticides. And what they are is they are made from other living organisms. So some of these names you might rec uh, recognize. So on the top left, bacillus. If you have ever used BT, um, let's see, common name, dipel, um, I'm not thinking of another example, but sometimes it's just called Bacillus thuringiensis on the label itself. Um, that's the most common. There's actually several different species of Bacillus um, that treat not only insects, but also uh, fungal diseases as well. Um, but it works so well because it stores great long periods of time um, and it can, it's effective in different temperature uh, regimes as well. So a lot of different uh, biopesticides, and this is not for you to read, but just to see, okay, for insecticides, there's, this is not even um, maybe, I don't know, 20% of the list. But um, bio, um, pesticide companies are registering um, dozens every year. It's just becoming a booming, booming industry uh, because of the demand of these different types of products. 
and they're all for the most part um, organic certified. So there's bioinsecticides and biofungicides. So I just want to finish up and give you guys um, just uh, a few resources to get some more info. Uh, there's, I mean, there's hundreds of different uh, websites and ways to get information, but Cornell has a nice um, biological, biological control website that has just about every um, natural enemy you can think of. Lots of great information. So if you just Googled biological control Cornell, then you can come to this, this website here. And then as far as books um, or other materials, the, um, the study I had mentioned earlier about um, folks at Michigan State University looking at the specific, what beneficials are visiting the flowers and then what flowers had the most beneficials, they created this uh, fact sheet here. So you could Google the title of that um, and get all that information um, and more. They have a whole, I don't know, two-page list of uh, plants that they've listed and which ones are, again, the most effective. So that's a good publication. And then the Xerces Society has this book. You can get it on Amazon. And this focuses more on that idea of the conservation biological control, how to do these plantings, um, how to prep the soil. And uh, it does talk about some of the, the beneficials as well. And in terms of the hedgerows, so I mentioned that was a study out of California. So they have uh, developed that, this publication specifically for uh, hedgerow plantings and how to maintain them and what are their benefits. And then finally, for biopesticides, there's an organization called IR4. And if you Google IR4 biopesticides, then you can find this database and you can select your crop, the pest, and get a listing of what are the recommended biopesticides. And again, they'll, they'll all be uh, organic options. All right, so there is my email, although Cami, I think she mentioned she put it in the chat, but you can feel free to email me or Cami anytime or call us, that's what we're here for. Um, uh, are there any other questions in the meantime? Yes, um, someone said here in Mesa, Arizona, we paint the trunks of our fruit trees don't know why we do it what benefits does painting the trees with whitewash have okay yeah so um yeah Kimmy, we should do some fruit webinars <laughs> yeah someone else asked if we would please do that so yeah. okay <laughs> all right so yeah the idea of painting the trunks white is to reflect the heat in winter um a lot of fruit trees, peach, apricot, are have a little bit thinner bark, and they're susceptible to what's called sun scald. It's where the bark heats up during a warm day, and then freezing cold temperatures at night can kill the bark. So whitewashing the trunk is simply to prevent that uh, injury to the bark, um, and the injury to bark can lead to all kinds of other problems. So that is an important practice. Awesome. Okay, and someone else said, yes, please do fruit tree webinars. So. There's well, more interest, yes. So great. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, someone asked if this recording will be available later, and it will. I'll send you all a link to the recording when it's available. I'll put it up on our YouTube channel. I actually have a question about bringing in um, pests that help out. Like, how do you get them to stay on your trees? I we have uh, like we have a burgeoning hop production business in western north carolina folks are there's a lot of breweries around folks are starting to do these boutique hop trees and ladybugs are good for uh eating aphids on hop plants but like is there a way to attract them i'm just thinking especially on a smaller if you've got a smaller farm with with hops okay how, yeah how do you get the right bugs on the plants that you want them on Okay. Well, the right bugs will find the pests, number one. But I think the initial part of your question you asked, well, can you bring them in? And that's one thing I didn't really talk about so much. Lady beetles are not an example of something that you want to buy and release out in the landscape. Because typically, the ones that are sold are collected up in the mountains. And uh, once they're uh, release, they are ready to disperse and find um, their own territory. So they're not going to necessarily stay. 
but um, I've actually released parasitoid wasps for aphid control out in the landscape and they pretty much will stay and take care of a lot of the aphids um, on site. Uh, but again, they will also need that uh, the flowers because the adults need pollen and nectar to give them that uh, burst. So putting in the plantings um, and, and doing uh, releases of certain, the right type of beneficial can work. On hops, uh, spider mites might be a problem as well. So I had, men I had mentioned the beneficial uh, predatory mites, and those also can be released in the landscape because they're just crawling around. They're not going to be dispersing. They're going to stay on site. So those would be two examples of things that you could buy and release. you got to pay. Um, but it's good if you're going to do that to have that source of uh, habitat, nectar, pollen, or whatever that's going to keep them on site. Thanks. Um, I just want to mention real quick, we have a survey. Um, if you would please fill that out, I'll send the link in the chat box. So you can just go to that link and fill out the survey. It's just um, for all the webinars that we've given this far. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah, we will add uh, fruit webinars to our list. Yeah. <laughs> it might be something to, uh, to start next winter as we're kind of gearing up in the season, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. We may be able to add some this spring. Thank you so much. So I guess that concludes this webinar. And yeah. Cami, there's one coming up, right? Yes. The next one is on April 6th, I believe. April 6th, um, Ron Patterson will be giving that one. And it's at um, 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So. And it's on trellising tomatoes, Turning right? and trellising tomatoes, yep. Okay. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank Bye. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.